like uh, waterways, but it's important for you to understand that the same happens with light, because it's the same law. Uh, in this video, it's very interesting that uh, it will show you uh, a light beam, a laser beam, hitting a slit. And what happens? Uh, this laser hits a slit and it splits. So not only it splits, as you can see, he's uh, uh, adjusting the width of the split as he is showing. So it's not a lens, it's just a slit. But you can alter the trajectory of the laser, which is light, by having this obstacle, this physical obstacle. And he's changing the width. And then what you see after this obstacle is the laser hitting uh, the plane and not all the laser that left the emitter hits the, the plane. It, it splits at right and left. So not all the energy of the laser goes straight. For example, if you give a number uh, uh, like laser has a power of 100 what hit in the straight line is not 100 because it, i would say it hit like 50. all the rest of the laser energy is split between the right and left points and also he's changing the distance between the points so this uh larger mark of laser is the part that wasn't deviated it went straight the first left and the first right are the first division of this link this laser the second right and left are the second division and so on you can change the amount of uh, the division of this laser and you can change the distance. So everything you can do uh, with diffraction, you can do uh, uh, with lenses as well. Uh, and, and this is an example. And uh, he's showing you a diffractive lens, diffractive lens grating, and he will light up the laser, what will happen, you already know. Some parts of this laser will not deviate, which is this strongest one. But the first order of the division, which is the first left and the first right, are the first division, and so on. So now we can understand that part of this deviation is not uh, happening because it goes straight and so this is the, the same uh, experiment showing showing you the rational when you uh, when you hit the laser in this diffractive screen a part goes straight ahead with no deviation it's the order zero order zero means there was no deviation. The first order, uh, there's a notation for this order, the plus one and the minus one, which is the right and left side of the division, of the splitting of the laser. And then you have the other order, orders, which is M2, M3, and 4 and so on. Uh, what is interesting, as I said, that not all the energy that left the laser beam is hitting the M0. For example, you can design the diffractive obstacle to pass on as much as energy without deviation as you want. It's a matter of designing this element of diffraction. So, for example, as I said, if, you, if the laser beam is 100 as it leaves the beam, when it 
split is it split uh, in uh, the into the uh, diffractive screen. I uh, one can choose that uh, forty percent of this laser goes straight ahead through order zero with no deviation whatsoever. Uh, the second order can go with uh, I would say twenty percent or thirty percent. And then the second order, right and left, would go with less energy, at 10% or 5% and so on. You can design all these modulations in the diffractive obstacle. And one thing that is interesting to note in this picture is that the difference uh, between the distance of the first and the second order is the double of the zero and first order. As you can see, if you can uh, find a ruler and approach in, at the screen, you will see that the distance between N1 and N2 is the double of N0 and N1. So uh, it doubles the distance. And this is important for our future concepts in, in terms of uh, uh, diffractive IOLs. So, uh, if you if you are having some trouble uh, seeing the whole uh, slide because of the video, you can just uh, drag the video of the speakers uh, or the participants anywhere in the screen so you can see all the slide. Uh, so, diffraction is a phenomenon that uh, uh, when a wave encounters an obstacle. Whenever you forget what diffraction, from the concept of the diffraction is, you remember the term interference. It's about the synonym. So uh, there is a bending of waves around obstacles, and it happens with water, water waves, etc., and even visible light. Uh, so, as Richard Feynman, uh, famous uh, physicist, already said, there is no difference in the concept of uh, uh, interference and diffraction, diffraction. So you can use them uh, interchangeably so you can remember. Uh, this is a pattern of diffraction. You can draw any pattern as, as you want. You can draw a slit, you can draw a wall, you can draw uh, like a church or a pyramid, and this is the pattern of diffraction that is used in our ions. It's a pattern named as kinophone. So it's like this V-shaped uh, 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 form, and the diffraction happens when the wavelength hits this angled surface. So the kinophone pattern is what all the diffractive IOLs have in common. As you can see in this enlarged picture of a um, diffractive IOL, uh, so many manufacturers have it's like different approaches in their uh, disposition of the diffractive rings, uh, but it's all about the same principle. Kinophone surface over an IOL, either in its anterior surface or posterior surface, uh, covering all the surface, or I would say half of the surface. It's a, a manufacturer philosophy. Uh, so this is what happens when incident light hits a uh, diffractive surface of the IOL. Uh, you can see that the white arrows or full are, are large, and when they hit the diffract surface, you can see already the white arrows, but smaller ones because not all the uh, not all the energy is directed towards this deviated white arrow. Now you know that there are more orders of deviation as shown in the gray arrows, uh, smaller ones, 
And uh, these are part of the desired effect of the diffraction, which is you bend uh, the, the incoming light wave, or uh, also the undesirable part, because it also splits in orders that you don't want, more orders that you wanted, but it's, uh, it's a property, it's a, a property of the diffraction itself. Uh, and as I was studying the diffraction, uh, one thing that I was uh, very confused about is that I thought, uh, well, uh, as it is a lens and the wa wave light hits the surface, diffraction happens, as, a, as you already understood. But is it refraction also happening? So uh, I found out this uh, paper which clarified me that uh, in some extent, uh, 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 kinochrome lens or uh, our lenses, our interocular lenses, uh, do have uh, uh, like a refractive, diffractive behavior uh, because uh, uh, it's a lens, not just an obstacle. So you have both of these effects. Uh, so you, you can have uh, 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 the refractive lens portion of the same diffractive surface. Uh, uh, I, I want to go very deep into it, but uh, I leave you with the, the reference here, which is uh, a paper of uh, physical optics that uh, gives a very good explanation about this coherent superposition of this effect. Uh, you can modulate the deviation of, of the wave by designing uh, the kinoform uh, design. So uh, uh, you can change its width and height. So you can bend the, the light wave in order to reach uh, a point, a focus that you want. So uh, this is how you draw your uh, diffractive optical surface of an IOL. So this is the, the, the example of uh, the adjustment you can make with the diffractive inoform surface in uh, our IOLs. You deal with the addition and it is related to the width of the uh, kinoform surface and you also deals with you also deal with the height which is uh, related to the division of energy. As I said, you can deviate uh, uh, the, you can split the energy between, I would say, near or far or intermediate as you want by designing uh, its property in the height part of the diffractive design. Uh, so this is the profile of a kinoform uh, IOL, diffractive IOL, and these are the aspects you can deal with. You can deal with the height and the width. Uh, also, one of the properties that you can play with in the design is with apodization, which I think uh, most of colleagues already uh, know about, but uh, I, I will br briefly explain this. You can Decide, you can opt to uh, make different options of splitting the energy in different portions of the IOL. For example, in the parts more near to the center, the energy between uh, near and far is quite equal. But as you go towards the periphery of the IOL, you can choose, it depends on the manufacturer, you can choose to split the energy of the light, prior, giving priority to, to far vision, for example. 
and less energy to new vision. So it's an option for the manufacturer. So his rationale is that when you're driving, your pupil expands, and then your vision would be better in mesop situations uh, when you're driving, for example. But the trade-off is that it will get worse in uh, in near vision for in these mesop conditions. So uh, we already have this. We already had the experience with the restore lenses, in which our patients uh, complain of the near vision in mesop conditions, like in a restaurant reading their menu. And this is how uh, this graphic behaves. You can see uh, the uh, the near vision in orange decreasing as the pupil dilates. So that's why it's it's declining the the uh, the energy. So less energy, less quality of vision as the pupil dilates, but. Uh, the energy for uh, far is increasing as the same pupil dilates. So it's the effect of apodization. Uh, it's an option, as I said, for each manufacturer. Some of them uh, use this effect of apodization, uh, uh, understanding that it's uh, preferable to the uh, patient. Well, the other thing that I'm going to show you is how uh, the component of diffractive and refractive part of the IOL is uh, is mounted. So this is a, a, a very crude uh, design of a regular 20 diopter IOL monofocal. And then what you do is you just insert a surface in, when you have a by focal ion, for example, we insert this kiloform optic in its anterior or posterior surface, depending on the manufacturer. So now uh, you have this refractive and diffractive areas of the optics, and this is the uh, the way our IOLs work. They have the uh, uh, base of 20 di diopters IOL as you wanted and the engraving of the diffractive surface. Uh, and in this design, I also changed the blue arrows energy and I'm going back to, to the monofocal. All the energy is directed towards the focal point of far, for example. And there is no splitting of the energy. All the incident light goes to form this focal point of far. When you use diffractive uh, technology, as you remember, you're splitting energy. So one part went to form this far focus, and it is formed by the order zero. There is no interference for from the diffractive optics, as you remember. Only the refractive 20 diopters refractive effect, effect is uh, happening here. Uh, and you chose to deviate about 45% of the incident line. This is one rational of design. And then, the first order of deviation of the diffractive surface, you can opt to give it like a 3.5 um, uh, diopter of deviation uh, using the rest of the energy, not all the energy, because some part of this energy is lost to other orders, as we remember. So the main orders that you're using now is the zero order, which is making the far focus, and the first order, which is now giving you the first order for near. So this is the basic design of uh, uh, a bifocal IOL using a diffractive surface. 
Now you understand that. Easy peasy. Uh, so what happens when you uh, uh, what happens if you take these uh, two uh, principles? I just grabbed the two uh, slides that you saw. And when you use uh, the the excuse me, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna back here because I, I just didn't put uh, one of the oh. this is the this is the second order that you are not using, okay? Uh, this is the second order that you you're using uh, uh, that is happening in the diffraction. But uh, unfortunately, this slide is wrong, uh, uh, my, uh, my mistake. Uh, as we remember, this second order is not 3.5 diopters. I'm going to back in this slide. The second order uh, would be uh, the 3.5 uh, uh, so I, I just mixed the, the, the slide here. I'm going to back here. Order 0, par, order 1, near. Uh, order 2. Yes, it's the, the, the second order is too near. Uh, it's wrong here. It's way near. It would give uh, uh, the double of the first order. The first order was 3.5. The second order would would be seven diopters, so this is the uh, would be the correct way to understand here. Uh, the the writing is wrong here. Uh, so the second diffract order, uh, which is undesirable and you don't use, would be seven diopters. So your bifocal IOL has a second order of uh, seven diopters, which you don't use it which is a very low energy, about 2%, 3%, uh, but it's, it's an effect, as, as you know. Uh, uh, yes, I'm sorry, this is the, this is the, this is the right uh, slide, with the very near seven diopters uh, of the second order. I'm so, I'm so sorry for mixing up the, the slide. Uh, yeah, it's uh, okay, good. Uh, so uh, now I have the the this in the first slide. I have the desired first order that, that I'm using in this bifocal ones, uh, which has three point five diopters. I have the undesired uh, second order, which is uh, uh, very low in energy, which is a. Uh, 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 a collateral effect of the diffraction, which is the double of the first order. And then came Damien Gatinel, and he thought on this very uh, wise uh, principle. He thought, what if in the first order, I, I would use not 3.5 diopters, I would use just 1.75 diopters in this first diffractive order. Good. So uh, now we can understand that we are using this first order for intermediate. But what happened is the loss second order, and you can manage the energy by adjusting the height, the second diffractive order that we were not using now is being used uh, because it's the double of the first order, the double of 1.75 is 3.5, so it's near for us. Now we have uh, uh, an oil that uses the first and the second order. The first order is for intermediate vision, second order for linear vision. So this is the idea of Damien Gatinel for the trifocal uh, IOLs, and uh, we can see in this picture that the second order uh, is being used now, and, and it 
which it was being lost in the first generation of iOS. I'm so sorry for the mess. But uh, very good. Now we have these iOS that have near vision or intermediate vision. And now I'm completely happy. Uh, maybe uh, now we understand the principles and the fundamentals of the diffraction and the options we have for our patients. And this is what I offer to my patients now. He has cathet and he's also presbyopic. He depends on his glasses. Uh, he has provision. He's presbyopic. And when I implant a multifocal eyewear, eyewear, either a bifocal or a trifocal one, uh, he gets very happy. He improved his vision. Well, He's happy because he forgot how he saw, he really saw. He remembers his condition with Catherine, but he forgot how he saw when he was young. When he was young, he was not presbyopic, and light was not being split. The last, uh, the last uh, picture at right, has all the focus from far, near, and intermediate in focus, but all the energy was split in order to form these images. Uh, when you're young, you have all this far, near, and intermediate vision, but with all the energy. So this is the trade-off of a diffractive multifocal IOL. Uh, they reduce the quality of vision, they reduce the contrast sensitivity. They increase the visual acuity for these distances, but with the trade-off of decreasing quality. So it's a great limitation. Uh, that's why the holy grail for accommodative situations and cataract uh, is in accommodative IOLs, which are we are uh, quite far. Uh, at the moment. Now we can understand when we go into the specifics of uh, the IOLs, uh, some aspects. Uh, they provide uh, near and intermediate points differently. Uh, we can understand that uh, in this line that is uh, marking the focal points. We can now understand the total light utilization, okay? The total light, because part of the light is not uh, used because it is lost for higher orders than order two, for example. So, uh, no, uh, uh, all the IOLs lose a part of their energy to higher orders. So that's why they never reach the total 100%. Uh, the other aspect, the light energy distribution, uh, this 88%, for example, how does it being distributed? So now you understand that depending on the design of the diffractive uh, steps, you can uh, divide the light energy for distance and intermediate and near. Uh, other thing interesting in this uh, table is the diameter of the central zone, which is different for even uh, for every manufacturer, uh, and it's important because uh, of the decentration that can happen in these IORs. Um, so now we can understand uh, some parts of the of these uh, uh, tables. For example, here the uh, we add powers for near and intermediate, for example. Uh, we can now also understand the graphics uh, comparing a bifocal and a trifocal IOL. Uh, uh, the bifocal IOL has this uh, decrease in this intermediate vision, and the trifocal one has better uh, uh, performance in this uh, intermediate area. Uh, this is the typical kind of form for a uh, bifocal diffractive surface. Now you understand the, 
which is uh, bifocal, cannot form diffractive surfaces. It has one peak in its design, and uh, a typical trifocal one has two peaks, as you can see, uh, two heights of uh, uh, diffractive peaks, and each manufacturer uh, has its own uh, principles of design. Uh, I'm, I'm not going into the specifics here in terms of the design, but uh, uh, each one has its uh, own philosophy. And it's very easy for you to see here in the case of the physio that it has, uh, which was the uh, 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 pioneer in trifocal with uh, Damien Gatineau, that it is uh, apodizing. The, the height is decreasing as it goes to the periphery. It's a, it's a rational for the manufacturer. Uh, also, we have in this uh, nice table uh, some details about each uh, trifocal oil, how much of the energy is lost, the defective order. It is very interesting. Now you, you understand what happens with the orders and uh, what the design does with specific orders. Uh, you have something to read in the next days of your uh, quarantine. Uh, I'm, I'm going to finish my presentation, leaving you with a teaser of an uh, invitation for a webinar that is going to happen on uh, Monday, this Monday, uh, April 27th. I don't have the link yet. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, share the link in my Facebook page, facebook.com dash Milton uh, point Yogi. Uh, and uh, it will be, uh, the webinar will be uh, with Dr. Ike Ahmed talking about his challenging phases. Uh, Time will be uh, at 12 noon Eastern time uh, this Saturday, excuse me, this Monday. So uh, I will provide the link on uh, maybe tomorrow. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much for invitation. Thank you so much for giving me this space. And I congratulate Dr. Dr. Abdugani for this effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mitson. Uh, you give us a lot of information. Uh, there were a lot of question marks about the designs of the trifocals, how do they work. It's been wonder how does they work and your uh, demonstration of the mechanics of actions that uh, delighted us very well. Since we don't have a question here, uh, can I ask about the patient when we, when we implant trifocal lenses, the patient will give us a feedback about halos. These halos, are they due to the order one and order two diffractions? Uh, in terms of the halos, it's, as we saw, it is intrinsic to the design. Every time you have a focus being formed before the macula, for example, this focus, it will not, not stop here, and the macula is here. It keeps off the light, doesn't have a stop. It will continue and hits the retina. When it reaches the retina, because of the first, fall, uh, first order or second order, when it hits the retina, it reaches out of focus, far from the macula or the focal point. And this area that it hits, creates a halo. So uh, halo is intrinsic to the diffractive principle, no matter what. For example, we have the e of IOLs that work in this diffractive principle, for example, the symphony or the Lara, and they also have halos by design. You can have more or less, depending on how much energy do you deviate to form this intermediate focus and 
as it is less energy, and when it hits, it hits the retina, it has less pronounced halos, but it's all by design. So first, any defective IOL has halos. It is by design, no matter what the manufacturer says. says. Of course, other than uh, defective optics, other aspects come into play to form and generate halos. For example, chromatic aberration also gives halo. Uh, 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 poor surface in cornea or lack film tear, they also generate some kind of halo and glare, uh, dysphotopic symptoms. So part of the dysphotopic symptoms are due to optics themselves, uh, surface, and when we say surface is the topography of the cornea, uh, its regularity and tear film, and uh, the third part is pupil, which plays uh, also a, a role in this photopsia. Can I add a comment? All right, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Sir Lokan. Uh, I want to add just that uh, the diffractive IOLs and all the multifocal IOLs are technology developed for a metropic condition. So we need to pay attention to uh, the defocus as a source of halos. Also, as Dr. Milton perfectly described, every myop knows the halo because the focal point is in front of the retina. Uh, the same uh, principle applies to the tri trifocal or bifocal lens, but if it's emetropic, you will have one or two halos. If it is myopic, you will have doubling of these effects. So probably if you want to make some mistake in your calculation, it's better to be hyperopic to increase the undesired optical phenomenon by one, uh, but not myopic because you will increase them by two. So this is a small advice. We have a question from Jeremiah. Uh, it says, is this true? Is this a statement true? The lower the ad, the lesser the glare and halos and vice versa. Uh, uh, it's not, uh, I, I don't know if Luca is very well versed in, 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 in optics. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sh shine in my opinion, but I would love to see the uh, to hear the opinion of Lucan, uh, I think most part of the uh, the halo and glare is modulated by the energy division. So the way you divide the energy itself is uh, the way the halo will be presented. Uh, the the uh, the add power is related to the size of the halo. Just, just to con from, uh, yeah. just a second, okay. just to continue sure. the line of thinking of Dr. Milton, the uh, power of the art is not directly related to the halo, in my opinion. It is, it's coming from the design. For example, if you have a bifocal lens, you will have two prominent uh, rays, which are with more energy which explains why some trifocal designs, when you talk to the patient, they uh, report less halos because of the energy of the steps. So probably the trifocal technology is really evolution of the bifocal and probably it's better in terms of uh, undesired optical effects. Uh, I know that it sounds a little bit uh, complicated, but the energy of the focal point determines the intensity of the halo. This is my logic. Very good. Okay. Uh, 
Doctor, which one do you have a particular type of uh, trifocal lenses do you prefer in practicing daily practice? Actually, no. Uh, I, I love to use all the platforms and uh, in terms of IOLs, in terms of machines, uh, and regarding the trifocal ones, uh, in terms of their specific performance, visual performance, uh, I, I find a very little difference between them, uh, and I, I would uh, uh, attribute this to the design technology that uh, is quite uh, uh, equal to all the manufacturers. There is slight difference in terms of the distance of the near and, and, and intermediate points or the light distribution, but in fact, for the patient themselves, I see very little uh, distinction. Uh, I would also like to, if you allow me, present two or three slides in order to better explain the halo, because halo is something that we always talk about. Uh, it's so intrinsic to our patients, but we don't get to the point in terms of understanding why it happened. May I? Yes, sir. Uh, it, I, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, uh, the, Dr. Lucan will uh, help the, for the delay of talk of Dr. Lucan. No, I don't have issues with time. The time is ours. <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, the, the, this, is, this is a presentation of mine. Uh, the, the brand. Uh, the question is, they are, we, we all wonder about these problems. So that's why I want to make a lot of uh, uh, notes and a lot of uh, important uh, answering the questions. And that's why. So go and explain uh, as much as you can. Good. Uh, uh, so I, I'm going to try to uh, 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 illustrate the origin of halos. Okay, so uh, halos are very intrinsic to the optical system, and halo happen with, with spherical aberration, due to spherical aberration, due to multifocality, and due also to uh, uh, multifocality, spherical aberration and chromatic aberration. I'm going to not delve into each of them, but I'm going to illustrate the, uh, the formation of halo uh, independently of its source. I'm sorry for the logo of Johnson because it's a presentation of mine, but it was a training for the uh, consultants of Johnson I gave recently. Uh, the, the design I, 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 I tried to uh, illustrate is I got a simple uh, schematic of uh, 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 focus formation, as you all know. Okay, in this example is uh, uh, a spherical aberration uh, focus point, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I put uh, the surface of a retina at the focal point, at the far focal point, as if you see it sideways, okay? So, uh, when you think of the retina and the formation of the focus point, you can see that, as uh, Lucan said, uh, the better formation of the image is when you hit the target you hit the focus right in the macula, for example. So uh, this is uh, uh, the better image. Uh, any image that is formed far from its desired point, for example, in this case, uh, the spherical aberration, rays coming from the periphery forming its focal point uh, before the retina, okay? or also it happens also in chromatic aberration or in multifocality as we saw so no matter the the, the, the source you can have formation of focal points but we also have to remember that as i said light doesn't stop there i just draw the extending light waves hitting 
the retina. So, very good. Now we have light rays hitting the retina. What happens now? These light rays that are hitting the retina, in the, in the center, they hit a perfect target and they draw the yellow uh, spot. But the light rays hitting the periphery draw a halo. It's like a, a torch, uh, like a, a lamp that you uh, ignite. So this is the formation of the halo, no matter from spherical aberration, which generates halos, chromatic aberration, which also generates halos, and multifocality. So this is the ideal patient, a metropic, all the yellow points, all the yellow energy coming towards the focal point in fovea, in his macula. Whenever multifocality or spherical aberration happens, not all the yellow rays fall into the same spot. So, yellow no more, it's less yellow because all the other yellow rays hit in the wrong area. It's the correspond it's corresponding to the halo that we saw in the previous slide. So you have several halos, you have several intensity of yellows expanding, uh, forming these halos. Uh, so uh, what is the problem with this image on the right? First, the energy of all the yellow light is spread through the halos. Your quality of vision, oh, I don't see my yellow wall as it was, because it is lost forming all the other focal points. So I hope it, uh, it, it clarifies in terms of where is the origin of the so-called halo. Uh, I'm going to finish this chapter now. Okay, so we'll go with the second uh, part, so topic uh, with uh, Sir Dr. Lucan. Uh, uh, the microphone is yours. Yeah, just a second to, to start the presentation. A lot of questions are there, but so we are running out to finish the first hour of the, of the meeting. Output. If you have a time at the end, we'll go back and discuss the questions. Is everything okay with the screen now? Yes, very good. Ah. Okay, so now, now after the complicated uh, world of uh, diffractive uh, technology, I will dive into the not less complicated world of the emerging EDOF lenses. I think that uh, we switch our thinking and our approach of uh, using and choosing IOLs based on our knowledge of the technology. Uh, okay, we have, I call it transitional EDOFs, which are like squeezing the diffractive technology, uh, pointing the new way of the evolution of the optics implanted in the eye. Uh, I will just briefly Anna, mention uh, Symphony, Lara and Triumph as uh, such lenses. Then there, there is one lens which, which, which with I started the, my EDOF practice and this is refractive EDOF lens without spherical modifications. And this is a refractive lens oculentis comfort with near additional art of uh, diopter and a half, which is asymmetric. Then I think there are refractive EDOFs with spherical modifications. My current lens of choice is Synthesis Plus EDOF, and it is, uh, uh, in my personal opinion, the best one for me and my needs at the moment. It is produced by Cutting Edge SAS, France, then the other lens is Wutzidis, it is Swiss made, uh, Isopure 
Physio, Mini Well, and iHands. iHands is advertised from Abbott as a monofocal lens, but it uh, bears some marks of um, intermediate spherical modification. And I call them combo EDOFs. Uh, like the portfolio of the Swiss, Swiss brand Safio, Info, Eden and Harmonies, M plus X which combines uh, a refractive near at with uh, plus 3 diopters and adaptive paraxial optics on behind the lens to increase the uh, intermediate vision but I'll talk about later. And the last one which uh, emerged on the market is VVT from Alcon, which is purely refractive lens with a slight diffractive mask. So another thing to point in the diffractive technology is uh, not only the steps, but so-called face masks, which are borders with uh, less height but they act as a small apertures and they can change the light wave. Uh, last but not least, the uh, well-known pinhole lenses, uh, which we use uh, in our daily examination to check the vision of the patients, are uh, implemented in two designs. One is the IC8 intraocular lens from Focus. The other one is extra focus pinhole add-on lens from Morcher, but as I remember, it is a Brazilian doctor uh, established uh, this design. Am I right, Milton? Yes, uh, Dr. Trindade from Brazil. He's a young ophthalmologist. He's a genius. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, I divide them additionally to the zone which is most affected of the modification. The lenses which are with central modification are Woodsides, Comfort, Ihands, Isopure, Extra Focus, obviously the pinhole lenses. And what I meant to say here is that they are probably highly dependent from the centration of the visual axis and size and position of the pupil. Combo lenses, as I call them, M plus X, Info, Eden and Harmonies are a little bit less dependent of the visual axis that is not right for the M plus X. M plus X is, should be implanted near to the visual axis, otherwise it will not work. In other words, uh, with eyes, in eyes with uh, um, small angle kappa or myopic eyes. Or it's good to check that before you choose that patient. And the lenses which are with paracentral modifications, which means that the central part is more or less refractive and there is a spherical ring or zone of wavefront shaping, etc. The first one is Synthesis Plus, then is Miniwell and then is Vivity. Next thing to note is the position in the eye. Okay, all the other lenses are in the back, which means that we cannot predict their real centration, no matter if we use femtolaser or we use manual rexis, because the uh, capsular back is a irregular structure. It is like an ellipsoid back, which follows the curvature of the limbus. So, theoretically, in the eye with high astigmatism, we will have ir more irregular shape of the back. And when you implant the lens inside, we cannot predict where it will sit. Then is the Rexis fixated lens. The only one I know and I used is the Femtis Comfort IOL. And I think this is uh, the best uh, idea uh, to implant and align a lens according to the visual axis. But probably difficult to implement. And the last one is Sucos lens, which is add-on, which is the extra focus, and is really useful in traumatic cases or cases with highly irregular cornea. So, uh, this is the important thing that I stressed. This is 
both eyes of the same patient implanted with Lucidis. You see the uh, huge, as I say, huge positive spherical button on the middle of the lens. And on the left image, the button is aligned with the, um, with the pupil. On the uh, right image, it's not aligned. So this sometimes can sacrifice the amount of the EDOF effect because it is not according to the visual axis. And it can also lie your auto refractometer and we'll show you like minus one and a half or something like that. Despite the patient is with 100% vision because the rays of the auto refractor are passing not through the center of the optical zone, but on the transition zone. So now uh, this is the, a picture which I tried to uh, make with a video camera attached uh, to my microscope and playing uh, with the lens uh, in uh, water media and uh, aligning the light rays by different angles in order to see how this lens will behave in real world, like the, when the light is not passing directly through the pupil, pupil but it comes from uh, a side or something like that. So this is the image of the lentis comfort. Now you will see why the idea uh, of femtis uh, comfort is good, but it's diff difficult to be implemented because the implantation and the uh, other procedure is more complicated. Uh, this is uh, me doing <coughs> such procedure manually without femto laser because personally I think that uh, uh, the femto laser is not superior to the surgeon. So this is a uh, rexis which I made with my own hands and now you will see that first you should fill the eye with OVD then you need to implant the Fentis IOL there are four haptics now all the lens should be in the back then you need to refill again to have enough space for maneuvering now you need to engage the upper haptic which should go above the rexis rim and behind the iris. So, okay, now we should tuck it behind the iris. Then the side flaps. They should also go above the rexis rim, there is a small groove inside the optic. As I said, the design is really smart and in my opinion is good but demanding for manipulations. So any capsule with presumable zonular weakness is not a good candidate for such lens, of course. You see how many maneuvers one should do until the lens is on place. Now the lens is on place. So this is M plus X. This is one of the combo lens, as I call them. You have adapt adaptive paraxial uh, aspherity, which covers both foci for near and uh, uh, for far and for near. And that way it increases the intermediate vision, but is with really small central zone. So it's highly dependent from the visual axis of the patient. Then this is Lucidis. Uh, they call it near and intermediate vision pseudo non diffractive beam. It is nothing more than a central island. Uh, we know that from the refractive cornea surgery and it is a 
Central Island, um, Central, Central Island with a positive spherical aberration. That means it's highly dependent from the pupil size uh, and also that you know, the centration uh, according to visual axis uh, is really important. This is another picture of mine showing the spheri positive spherical button on the middle and less of the lens is ref re refractive lens, which is good in terms of uh, uh, light transmittance. This is uh, the Eden Info Harmonies family. You have a central positive spherical zone like the Woodsy Disc and then you have one diffractive and one refractive. Uh, Probably there are certain patients that could benefit from such design, but it is, it is not an all-rounder design, in my opinion, and generally I avoid that design. Uh, now, this is implantation of Woodsy-Dis lens. The things here are really less complicated co com compared to the Femtis Comfort. Uh, the optic and the haptic is easily implanted in the back and now you try to see the central zone which is now it will pop, on, pop up on your left side of the screen you see some rings there so it's probably not only the spherical button but probably there is a diaphractive uh, face max, uh, mask around it. Now, this is the Synthesis Plus. I, I must admit that I played a lot until I get such, I got to, uh, such image. If you look, the image is blurry and the haptics are not in focus. So it means that these optical transition zones are visible outside of the focal points of the lens, which is the most important factor. You see the middle area is clear, so this lens is not highly dependent from the pupil and from the visual axis. It can tolerate lower amount of decentrations and still maintain its uh, uh, depth of focus phenomena. So, this is uh, implantation, hydro implantation, because I like to implant this lens uh, with underwater. Uh, the lens is hydrophilic, but unfolds slowly. And it's really easy to be handled. And it can be used in complicated cases also. Now, this is the implanted lens. This lens is interesting, the IC8. I use it mainly in uh, highly irregular corneas, like post RK corneas, uh, like corneas with uh, ker in keratoconic eyes, because it uh, it is uh, a game changer there. There is no other optic that can satisfy the patient better. The only thing that one need to know is a little bit difficult loading, one should bend the forward haptic. And the other thing is that uh, this black uh, inlay on the center is PVDF, which is a little bit hard to be uh, uh, bended. So the incision should be above 3.5 millimeters in order this lens to be implanted. Me and my practice, when I finish the surgery, I put one Tenno suture and I remove this suture after uh, two weeks because 3.5 is large incision. Uh, this is the implantation of the lens. It behaves like normal C-loop lens. And uh, as I said, it's, the centration should be according to the pupil, but is hardly achievable in the back. Uh, the last lens that I want to show is the extra focus pinhole lens. Here it is a traumatic case 
underneath there is a Yamane fixated IOL and I'm using uh, Medicel 2.8 millimeters uh, cartridge here. The haptics are long because they need to fit on the sucus. And I need to admit that after implantation, on the next day, uh, the lens was where it's supposed to be, uh, confirmed by anterior segment osity. So the, the design is really clever and the mortar uh, as a producer is, uh, has done a great job as a manufacturer actually. Uh, now, the only thing that you need to do is to uh, slide the haptics on the sulcus. So, it is good for traumatic corneas and also for uh, additional add-on lens if you want to correct uh, any other corneal, corneal irregularities. So, now, this is the picture the picture of the day. These are the VVT, Synthesis Plus, Miniwell and Lucidis. From these uh, lenses here I have experience with Synthesis and Lucidis. I'm looking forward to try the VVT lens and I don't have experience with Miniwell. Now, to make things more complicated or more easy, I don't know, let's find out. I will introduce the Petzval surface. The Petzval surface is an element uh, used in the telescopes and uh, objectives of the photo cameras to correct the path of the light rays. If you see, you have a, sag a sagittal focal surface, you have a tangential uh, focal surface and Gaussian image plane, which we uh, can name the focal plane of the fovea. Uh, this uh, shape resembles also the shape of the eye and when we shift the focus with EDOF technology it happens like this I will return the slide again and when we shift the focal plane it happens like this I will point your attention not to the main focal plane but to the tangential one and the sagittal one. You see that there, there will be like a halos or there will be like additional focal points. Let's make things a little bit more complicated. Now, I think that the Synthesis Plus EDOF design plays with the higher order aberrations. And if you see the first picture, you have uh, a focal plane, which is obviously the black line, and you have the sixth order positive and the fourth order uh, positive, spherical aberrations. What are the spherical aberrations at all? The, these are all the surfaces which are even uh, e which are either uh, prominenting above the main spherical surface or are under above the main spherical surface, which means that they provide different focal points. So, if you somehow manage to balance both of such spherical phenomena, you will get on the right screen the green line, which is the balanced fourth and sixth uh, order of spherical aberrations. And they will provide exactly minus one and a half diopter ex extending depth of focus, which is the uh, stated uh, value of the synthesis EDOF and also the VVT EDOF. Now, I don't know if you lost me here, but I will try to keep up. This is another thing which can be done, and it's called Schmidt corrector for a higher order aberrations. So you can have 
combination by, dif by different refractive elements or diffractive ones, which can alter the shape of the wavefront of the light. So I'm sure that you lost me here already. And now, where to look if that is true or not? To ask the manufacturers or to listen to the industry? Because the manufacturer probably knows really well what is the principle behind his, uh, um, uh, his lens, but it is, he is not allowed to say it. The industry, they will all tell you that uh, their lens is the best and it is the uh, state of the art, etc. So we normally uh, um, get the question, where is the literature, literature, literature that supports your claim? Uh, actually, there is no literature, literature for EDOF lenses in the human eye, but there is a plenty literature in the optics of the microscope on the engineer, engineering uh, platforms and also in the patent offices. So this here is a patent from Japanese, I found one, which really resembles the shape and the picture of the synthesis EDOF lens. And it describes different areas of uh, wavefront shaping of the optic uh, of the optic thus provides different focal points then we have the vivity this is the vivity united states patent and we see that they combine refractive surface with diffractive uh, ring we can see everything in the patent so for me if i see the patent i hear the industry and I see the lens, this is my way of making an informed decision. Should I use that lens or I'm, I will not use that lens because I don't like the design. I'm not an engineer, but we all need to think like engineers because after we implant that lens, the questions will go to us, not to the engineers producing the lenses. So, this is the Lucidis and this is the patent of Lucidis, Central Island. Everything is described there, but we, we as a doctors, we are not used to search in the patent database of the engineering field, actually. So, is that picture now beginning to make sense? I don't know, but hopefully it gets. And now a short movie, which will show my pictures, uh, which need to provide a real world visualization of the optical phenomenon through diffractive and EDOF optics. Now, these are internal reflections between the rings. This is the Restore Plus 3 lens. This is the Starburst. This is the edge glare. Everything here is restored. Now, actually the refractive rings, they are small apertures. This is Atelisa. This is again Atelisa, the rings. surface reflections. This is what can happen when a light flashes directly to the eye. This is uh, fine vision HP. These are chromatic reflections. Here is resembling, resembling a flashlight. 
this is comfort TDOF M length is comfort and M plus X the woods it is and the synthesis plus as I said my lens of choice at the moment and a question for the audience and that's it thank you okay now uh, we do have questions here uh, this one question is directed to um, Dr. Lugi about how the contrast sensitivity becoming less in multifocal lenses. Actually, you answered this question, but uh, it's okay if you can demonstrate again to the audience. Uh, the contrast sensitivity in uh, any multifocal eye uh, well is decreased because uh, you have to split uh, the energy, the light that comes. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, bring almost all the slides I presented. Uh, they deal with it, uh, but anyway, uh, I'm gonna show uh, this one. And in this slide, we can see that uh, not all the blue energy that hits the lens goes to the first focal point of far. I would say less than half of the total energy. And then uh, part of the same energy uh, that hits the lens is directed to form another focal point. So if you, if you consider only the far vision in this case, you didn't get all the blue, uh, the blue uh, arrows that is had uh, is stricken the eye well, only half of them. So you, the, 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 the comparison, the analogy I like to make is uh, like when you change the quality of your inkjet printer in your house. Uh, you don't tell anyone, you don't tell your wife or your kids, and you just switch to economy mode. And then next week, your wife and your kids will complain. There is, the printer is with the problem. And what is the problem? I don't know. It's not the same anymore. Uh, what happened is that the inkjet printer is using half of the information or the ink to form the same image. So uh, uh, that's that's how the uh, decrease of quality of vision or less contrast sensitivity is. Uh, is noted by anyone. Yeah. Actually, uh, we do have patients sometimes, those who we like to try focal or video lenses with one eye, the other eye is normal. When we ask them about the contrast, uh, which one is more brighter, which one is more uh, little bit darker, the answer is if we try focal the eye with operated upon a little bit so the contrast sensitivity or the lightness is dimmer than the normal eye because of simply splitting the light into uh, parts. We do have another question from uh, Jemai uh, Collins. She says, have, this is for Dr. Lucan, have you checked the contrast sensitivity with the spherical aberrated IOL as because of their studies would like this? I'm not sure what is this. Can you see it, Dr. Lucan? Yes, the, the, the simplest way is functional and you can use a Pelly Robson or any uh, precision vision or 
certified uh, or even iPad contra contrast sensitivity uh, table. If you want to go a little bit more technical, I use uh, uh, a device uh, from uh, Opticon, which is a uh, mm, uh, wavefront uh, barometer, and you can see uh, you can see that actually there is no comparison between the diffractive IOLs contrast transmittance and uh, uh, especially the refractive uh, air and spherical aberrated EDOFs. Uh, I um, presume that the question is coming uh, from the thinking if we can use EDOF lenses in glaucoma patients or if we can use them uh, in diabetic patients or any condition with uh, decreased uh, contrast sensitivity. Uh, I generally avoid placing any EDOF lens in glaucoma eye because it's already uh, with uh, decreased uh, visual uh, field and sensitivity. So no matter that the EDOF lenses are inducing less light loss compared to the refractive ones, it's not right, in my opinion, to be used in glaucoma eyes. Um, so this is the short question, uh, answer. <laughs> uh, I also agree with Dr. Lucan in terms of uh, not using any kind of technology for presbyopia in glaucoma or macular disease eyes. There is a great uh, common sense, at least in Brazil, that some indoor lenses available here in Brazil are useful for these kind of patients because there's, a, I, I consider, a misconception that they don't lose contrast sensitivity. And by design, they do lose, by design. And uh, I would say, you don't even have to make, to perform a test because by design, they will lose contrast. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it's so widespread among surgeons community that I gave up on discussing on this. So many surgeons, they do implant EDOF IOLs thinking that they are allowed to do so because they give good quality of vision uh, that I gave up on explaining this. Okay. Uh... This question, I'm thinking about, I'm sure that a lot of ophthalmologists are looking at the same problem as an eye doctor. If he has to do a cataract surgery with lens and eye element to ourselves, what do you do advise? Because we are using a micro, surgical microscope. I'm not sure if the trifocal will solve the problem, will solve the problem, or we should implant the monofocal. Uh, I will wait for Dr. Lucan's opinion and I will follow him <laughs> because he's a very knowledgeable... I'm sure it's in the mind of a lot of doctors. <laughs> so, now th there are two uh, points of view. If you will going to use only the microscope or you will using a heads-up display. Because if you are using Ingenuity, for example, you are using your far vision and uh, there probably you can get away with diffractive technology. Uh, I should admit that I don't like diffractive technology. We, we had, uh, we, we, in fact, uh, we have discussions with Milton in the past about that. And I don't, I don't like and I don't use diffractive technology. Uh, actually, in the last three years, I haven't implanted a diffractive IOL at all. So my uh, answer for the surgeon which will use uh, oculars of the microscope should be to aim for a refractive EDOF lens with symmetrical design. Because as a vitreo retinal surgeon, I can share some interesting experience looking through these lenses. I have made uh, retinal detachment cases and peelings through Technis Restore uh, Fine Vision and 
there is an issue looking through the oculars or on the ingenuity there are blurring zones uh, compared and the overall light which I need to use inside the eye is more I need to crank up the chandelier to see the retina when I'm looking through diffractive optics that is why I avoid them uh, at all then I, I made a vitrectomy through M plus X remarkable no issue at all true Con, uh, Oculentis Comfort EDUF when you do a peeling you need to look through the far zone not from the near zone because when you are on the transition zone the image gets like uh, blurry so my uh, preference now and in fact the case I have done yesterday was retinal detachment with synthesis EDOF lens why? because the middle of the lens is large and refractive and when I go to the periphery the EDOF effect of this lens helps to the EDOF effect of the optical system that I use which is reside with Oculus lens so this is a neat trick to increase the quality of uh, the vitreo retinal surgery so I can sort of peek through the eyes of the patient but vice versa I'm looking through their lens inside so again my answer is if you are a surgeon do not put diffractive lenses in your eyes uh, uh, I, I absolutely agree uh, with so many aspects uh, with, with Lucan and because we exchange so many ideas but uh, uh, I also would prefer uh, this uh, uh, spherical aberration modulation or refractive manipulation uh, uh, IOLs uh, rather than the diffractive ones. Fact is that it's all that is available for us in Brazil at this time. Uh, I like so much the, the spherical aberration or refractive modulation design that I am the surgeon who most implanted the, uh, the crystallines uh, from Bosch and Long Crystallines HD specifically. Uh, the crystallines HD was known as a, a commodative IOL, but rather it had a spare collaboration area in its center, which gave it, 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 its speed off uh, effect. I was the surgeon who was most implanted implanting this IOL in Brazil, and so many doctors asked me about the commodative aspect, but it is uh, so long time ago that I used this lens, and it's, it, it's out of the market here in Brazil now. And the other fact is that uh, uh, Bosch replaced this HD model, which had this uh, spherical, uh, spherical central zone for the um, uh, crystallines uh, AO. A HD, uh, no, HD, uh, which is? AO. 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 AO, which was a regular spare collaboration uh, 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 IOL losing its central spare collaboration modulation and as soon as they switched the model, I stopped using it because I lost all the effect, the heat of effect. And uh, I presume they, they retired the HD model, I don't know, but I, I presume that uh, as all the heat of IOLs that relies on spare collaboration modulation, they have to be very well centered as mentioned by Lucan. So, uh, it, it was almost impossible for you to uh, see the, 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 the central area, so you could not, uh, I would say, so many doctors didn't use to center this lens correctly, so they had poor responses due to the ignorance of the doctors in which was the real effect. So that they were being misled by all the conversation of accommodation. On the other hand, 
That's why I talk so much with Lucan because uh, Brazil is about to receive these uh, refractive uh, Edof lenses. Uh, IHANS is about to arrive, uh, uh, VVT as well, and I'm eager to use them in my patients. I think uh, the, the, the division, the splitting of the light uh, to create Edof effect is more elegant in these uh, design things. Uh, uh, diffractive technology, I, I would say very crudely, it is more brutal in, in any diffractive design. Uh, the lens I would like in my eyes, and it's very specific because when I, it's an option, it's always a trade-off. You, you can never have everything in life. Uh, you, you, you deal with convenience or quality, uh, at this point, at least. So, so many patients, so many of our, of our patients, they do not understand what quality is. That's why they use their printers in any mode that is set up, or, or their TVs in the setup that is uh, default. They don't understand quality as well. So, they would rather prefer convenience of not using uh, uh, glasses anymore. So convenience is a trade-off in which you extract quality. On the other hand, when you want quality, there's no doubt a monococcal oil is all you want. So uh, in my case, at least, I'm a myopic guy. I am choosing to uh, keep my myopic uh, uh, glasses uh, I'm seven and four. I want to keep with three diopters myopic because I'm very comfortable in reading my iPad without glasses at night. So I want to stay with this. And I, I use it, uh, eyeglasses all my life. So uh, in order not to have my wife complaining, I will keep on my glasses. Uh, on the other hand, like uh, Lucan said, uh, it's very important for us to understand that uh, the current 3D options for surgery are based on polarized glasses. There are other technologies for 3D vision, but we are using at this time uh, polarized glasses. For what do they do? Simplifying. Uh, they actually they for each eye they cut about half of that vision, and they polarize it in a, 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 a direction. So, for example, in the right eye, I, the, 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 uh, the meridian that is offered you in the right eye, 50% of that M image is direct, it is in the horizontal direction. The left eye is it's an orthogonal, 90 degrees. So, first, you are dealing with half of image in each eye. So, uh, that's why you always, when you are you on uh, a movie theater, you are in, in 3D, you remove the glass and the image is much brighter because you're, now you're getting both of the images. When you put your polarized glass, the image dims at half, half approximately half, because each eye is getting only half. So, continuing with the, the rationale that Luca be, began, if you are a surgeon and you intend to use 3D, you better not use diffractive IOLs, because then maybe you will see with 10% of the image. That's a trouble money. We have a, a question from Dr. Zane. Uh, do you hear me, please? Yes. Yes. Uh, my question is uh, directed to uh, Dr. Lukan. Uh, we are pleased to be with you in this meeting. Thank you. Uh, as your practice, you use it. I am using uh, synthesis and lucidus, uh, and you have practice with both. Uh, the first question is, uh, what do you prefer, uh, which one you prefer and why in your practice? And 
My second question is, uh, when you implant lucidus, if you have a, a case of uh, wrecked one arm of the of the by by arm uh, optics, how do you manage uh, this in the back? Thank you very much. So for the first question, which one I like more, lucidus or? Uh, uh, synthesis or uh, which one I choose for who. Uh, now I don't implant lucidus because it's highly dependent from the pupil position. Also if you need to implant uniocular condition, so one eye is with pathologic cataract, the other one is okay, the other eye is okay, so if you put lucidus there the patient will definitely notice the uh, lower contrast and will make a difference between both eyes. Uh, why I choose uh, um, synthesis? Because synthesis tolerates decentration. As I uh, mentioned, the central zone is refractive and the first ring of transition is uh, like almost uh, 1 and 4 and 1 and 8 millimeters away from the center and it can tolerate a small dispositioning according to visual axis and uh, um, uh, pupil. So it's more versatile. And if you implant it in a uniocular condition uh, and the other eye is not uh, operated and it's with natural, natural lens, uh, the patients tend to not notice uh, the difference in terms of contrast. Uh, the other thing is you have both options. You have yellow tinted lenses, you have a clear uh, um, color lenses. So if you, will you, if you wanna implant both eyes, it doesn't matter what uh, color you will choose. But if you will keep the natural lens of the one eye and you will implant on the other, you better use the yellow tinted one because they always notice the difference between the clear lens and the natural lens. Uh, the other thing uh, which is important uh, is that the Lucidis, uh, as Dr. Milton pointed, uses a central island like the Crystal Lens HD. So this is a technology which is fairly simple to be produced and nothing fancy as an optical design, in contrast to the Synthesis EDOF, which is uh, balancing of the f fourth and sixth order uh, of the high order aberrations, uh, sorry, from spherical aberrations, uh, which sacrifices less light and uh, I believe provides a better image quality. Okay, this is a subjective, subjective opinion, but if I need to compare a, a patient with two eyes implanted with lucidus and two eyes implanted with uh, synthesis EDOF, definitely the chair time with the synthesis EDOF patient are lower or less compared to the lucidus one. I wouldn't implant the lucidus at all on myopic eye because they will see the difference. Uh, myops are uh, highly uh, sensitive about their near vision and about the contrast. They need to see everything big, black and contrast. Uh, that is not the case with almost any EDOF lens. So with that said, the EDOF lenses, especially the spherically aberrated ones, are not the best choice for myops if you plan to implant them emetropic. The good news is that in synthesis EDOF, we have a good number of myopic patients targeted to minus one and a half and we call it like office progressive setting. They are reading perfectly well on 30 centimeters, they are perfectly well on 16 centimeters to one meter and they keep their minus one and a half glasses for far. As Milton pointed, we keep their habits to have their glasses and we give them uh, fairly independence from glasses also. Because for a high diopter myop, like minus seven or minus six, 
far vision with minus one and a half is perfect vision at all actually so we need to uh, choose wisely the patient selection i think is the golden key to implement the edof technology in uh, the in our practice for the, we we try now to offer the edof technology to 80 percent of our patient flow and to get rid of the monofocal iols i think this is the next step in the evolution of cataract surgery so this is my short answer <laughs> I have an, a, a, a question. Yes, yes, please. Uh, uh, Lukan, uh, uh, with these refractive EDOF lenses, uh, what is the importance of the spherical aberration of the cornea? Because it's a coupling mechanism. So you have to have, uh, you know, the, the design of the IOL and its modulation, but it couples with the, uh, the cornea and uh, we are we are in, in a, a phase that uh, more and more importance in terms of analysis and selection of this cornea to achieve the right result for uh, uh, an IOL. And, and I would say that uh, different patients will have different performances in terms of uh, EDOF performance, not because of their low order aberration, but rather than higher order aberrations. So what is your consideration about that? Definitely, definitely it plays a role. And uh, I think the design of the lens also plays a role. For example, again, we see this where the central part is positively aberrated. When you couple this with, uh, for example, uh, hyperopic cornea, which is steep, and you have uh, additional uh, positive spherical aberrations, you can tip the scale to degrading the image, right? Not to have, uh, not to increase the depth of field. Uh, we, the, the, the most important thing that we need to realize is that there are borders on which the spherical aberrations are uh, useful and Above these borders, they will degrade the image. And vice versa uh, with the other lenses like VVT and Synthesis, uh, where the spherical elements are peripheral, probably uh, the influence of the corneal spherical aberrations will be a little bit less. But I agree that uh, we need to pay attention to that. Another thing that uh, when you bring that questions, question uh, uh, popped in my mind is, a post-refractive cases, especially uh, the post-R case, the post-myopic LASIK ones. In post-RK cases, I will definitely use pinhole lens. It will be better. But in post-refractive LASIK eyes, uh, especially for, for myopia, uh, the EDOF lens uh, gives a window of mistake. We know that we cannot uh, calculate so precise to be emetropic, uh, no matter how we calculate the lens in post-myopic uh, lazy eye. But if we have the octa and a half margin of error, which we can aim, we will get away with small amounts of refractive error. Let's say we have a plus and a half or minus and a half diopter, Probably, if you are into the one and, one and a half diopter window of the EDOF lens, you will still have good vision. This is a small tip that I use also. And I would also would like to, to comment on in this slide, what you, is what you was mentioning. Exactly, exactly. Please. We have a lot of questions. <coughs> uh, sorry uh, to interrupt you. There's a question also. The part two question of Dr. Zalna was what happens if they <coughs> we inject the lens and the haptic is torn or there was a complication? How can you solve the problem? So, uh, uh, for the Wuzidis in particular, uh, there are two decisions. The one is to expand the lens and implant a new one, uh, which is not really easy with uh, the Savio optics because they are thick. 
the other option is uh, a little bit exotic, but uh, I have uh, published in iTube a video on that. If you have a torn haptic, you need to uh, prepare the lens like with four independent haptics. So you cut the, the other haptic on the middle and you make a diagonal optic capture. Both haptics enter under the rexis and the other haptics enter above the rexis. If you have a good anterior rexis, you will achieve a good centration and you will get away between the raindrops. Otherwise, you need to explant and put an uh, additional one. Because uh, if you uh, implant in the back, uh, the tension of the uh, not damaged haptic will push the central zone uh, aside to the visual axis and the lens will be grossly decentrated. And the other question from Dr. Vazan. Could we implant monofocal in one eye and multifocal on the other eye? Milton? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, uh, uh, we even uh, performed a study here in uh, University of Federal University of Sao Paulo and uh, the, uh, the colleague that performed the study namely did the uh, uh, hybrid monovision in which you can use uh, 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 multifocal oil in one eye and uh, monofocal in the other eye, uh, all relates to the explanation and chair time you will have with the patient. You can, almost anything you can do uh, in terms of good procedure with the patient, better decision, but you have to explain everything because uh, there are always drawbacks, but there are always advantages. So, uh, for example, in this case, you will have the freedom of <clears throat> not using uh, 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 eyeglasses uh, because of multifocality in one eye. You will have very good quality of vision in the other eye. Uh, the patients, all the patients of the study, uh, 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 they uh, were very glad with the solution, but they were previously explained about it, and they have some colleagues as well that they do this option routinely. They are more comfortable in giving uh, multifocality in one eye. Uh, it's their choice of uh, conduct, uh, so uh, it is feasible. Again, you have to explain your patient beforehand. Okay. I actually do not advise <coughs> to implant a trifocal in one eye and monofocal in one eye because the principles of trifocal, the patient, in order to get the benefits, the most of it, you have to implant it bilaterally in the both eyes. One help the other eye. So one eye is trifocal, one eye is monofocal. He, he or she will not get the benefit of that or will not understand the importance of that eye. The only person who is getting benefit actually from this way uh, are the snipers, I guess. Uh, can, I com can I comment also on that? Because there is a, yeah. there is a psychological part of this. The brain need to, needs to choose constantly which uh, image to use. Uh, we need to remember that the unoperated eye is the image that the brain is used to see all life. Then you implant the three new images from which the brain should uh, learn how to choose the distances and it will be an addition continuous popping between both eyes and some patients can end with uh, some uh, psychological problems so as Milton pointed it is terms of psychology evaluation during the chair time and uh, explanation but you need to be sure that the patient has understand what you told him uh, it's a risky condition, uh, but for the trifocals and diffractive lens, for the EDOF lenses, I have done that with synthesis, I have done that uh, with uh, comfort uh, lens, and they tolerate it because the image and the, ex the, the, the focal points are not so prominent, it is like continuous focus, which 
probably deceives the mind that the image is more or less similar to the other and they adapt quickly to that. And uh, another question from Dr. Diar. Uh, are patch patients satisfied with near vision or with EDOF in comparing to the trifocal lenses? I guess he wants to understand uh, which one is superior for the near vision, the EDOF or the trifocal lenses. Milton, you first or me? Uh, you, please. Okay. Uh, so that is also highly dependent from the design of the uh, lens. Um, um, I divided the lenses uh, by different uh, uh, entities, but I can divide them also to a uh, distant dominant and near dominant ones. Uh, for example, uh, we discussed all the meeting uh, Wuchidis and Synthesis. Wuchidis is definitely near dominant lens because uh, they advertised plus three di diopter uh, um, addition, which is uh, okay actually for reading and they are happy with their reading. Implant one, emetropic, and the other one, which uh, will be the non-dominant uh, in the best scenario, minus half diopter. Then they see perfectly well far and near they starting to read between 35 and 40 centimeters, which is, uh, let's say, the modern near, near distant uh, for emetropic eye, not for myopic, right? Yeah, yeah uh, uh, actually I use very, very little read off I was here in Brazil because as I said, uh, the options I had are only diffractive and uh, I would say, uh, I, I would trade uh, the diffractive read off IOLs for the trifocal ones uh, because I'm losing the near vision with the diffractive read off IOLs I'm losing the, the, the near vision and I don't think, I don't feel that I'm gaining anything, especially in terms of quality of vision with the options I have here in Brazil at this moment. So uh, that's the option I, I do have uh, uh, currently in Brazil. Uh, hopefully, as I said, we will have other EDOF uh, refractive platforms. Okay, uh, we will try to uh end the session, but before that, uh, I have another question in my mind uh, about the size of the pupil and type of the, of the patient happiness. Because the uh, uh, dark or brown colors eyes have a smaller pupil size than those who are light pupils, uh, light uh, iris color. So does it affect on the patient happiness, the smallness of the pupil or the largeness of the pupil? Uh, starting with you, Sir Nelson. Uh, well, uh, other than extreme uh, uh, large or extremely small pupils, uh, and uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't see a great effect, especially in these diffractive IOLs, uh, so I would I would uh, uh, leave out the extreme. So, uh, so uh, I had I had a case on a patient which uh, probably I uh, didn't choose wisely. Uh, I I implanted uh, Comfort EDOF, which is known to have a small central part, and then the patient came the next day with uh, one and a half millimeter uh, pupil without uh, we uh, installing any instilling any uh, pupil constriction drops and she was like okay I see far but I don't see nothing near then we dilate the pupil, the pupil and she's like okay now I'm seeing near also and the next day she was again with us I, again I don't see uh, the near part. So, for the EDOF lenses, they are definitely more dependent from the size of the small pupil compared to the diffractive ones. So, uh, as we uh, pointed, uh, uh, if you have a patient with closed, closed angle glaucoma, obviously you will not implant an EDOF lens if the patient should be on a pilocarpine. 
right as Milton pointed, the extremities should be avoided. Uh, okay. If you if you if you imply for a larger pupils, uh, the uh, the problem there is sometimes the design of the lens. If the lens is not uh, with continuous optical power equal on the all parts of the lens, and you have a distant part which is thinner or thicker, it will uh, induce a negative or positive dysphotopsia in large pupils. So, again, patient selection, lens selection, everything is individual. If you have uh, time, uh, there is one raising hand and more question. Do you have time to answer it? Yes. Okay, and Dr. Michel Ezra. Oh, hello. Um, I'm just caught, um, somebody was asking me, can you use Synthesis Plus in post myopic LASIK patient? I, I, I just switch one for Lucan, please. Yeah, I, I think I already answered that, but I will repeat. Uh, I used, uh, yesterday, I had a retinal detachment case uh, with post-myopic cornea for LASIK. The axial length was 27 millimeters, and uh, the lens that I implanted is 20 diopters, and it is synthesis uh, plus EDOF. I calculated the lens with uh, Shamas no history, method and uh, confirmed by Barrett through K. Uh, the measurements were on Landstar actually and I find it particularly useful because you have a diopter and a half margin of error or window of aiming because we know that our calculation cannot be certain in post myopic LASIK eyes uh, to be plano and I needed to have a plano refraction because the other eye is also post LASIK and is plano. So if I have the opter and a half window on which I can aim my calculation is better than to have a simple uh, monofocal optic. This is my tactic. Okay, so the answer is yes. Let's yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, that's fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, do you have any experience with the uh, Trinova Acriva lenses, trifocal principles? Uh, actually, sorry, Milton, uh, I will answer first. Uh, Trinova from Acriva is a Turkish lens, and it was. Uh, uh, manif uh, the, the facility that manufactures these lenses also works for Bosch and Lomb and their lens was called Versario 3F. I had implanted Versario 3F uh, in one hyperopic, hi highly hyperopic case. The lenses were 30 diopters and he was extremely happy. Extremely happy and no chair time, we got a good calculation, plano, and if these lenses are emetropic as end result, they definitely work. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, we, we don't so have these high oil in person. No, you don't have it, okay. Uh, we implanted here a, lot, uh, a couple of patients. Uh, it was from Holland, I guess. Might be there are companies or in Turkey they do manufacture it. Mm -hmm. Again, they were very happy and deliberately asking them about halos. They say no, there are no halos. But it was interesting. Yes, we addressed that because the intensity of the uh, focal point, points is less than a bifocal lens. So it's uh, strange, but trifocal lenses with such uh, di distribution, they have less uh, unwanted uh, visual phenomena. Search Lucan and Melton if you have nothing to add. Uh, I will be happy to announce the ends of the events. Good. Uh, uh, I, I would love to uh, congratulate 
uh, all your effort in bringing education, continuing education to no, colleagues all over the world. And it was a great, great honor uh, and a pleasure. And I send a salute from all our colleagues from Brazil as well. Uh, I want to thank you also for organizing this event. I want to thank you for invite, inviting me to be here. And um, it was a pleasure, uh, as always, to discuss with uh, Professor Milton and uh, uh, with the audience. Thank you for the questions and greetings from Bulgaria. Thank you. The honor was ours to invite you and sharing your idea, listening to you. It was very helpful to us. Uh, thank you all of you for listening to us and we will be waiting for you again tomorrow. We do have another event. Goodbye all of you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.